going to start in 2 Timothy. You can actually, though, go to Ezekiel 9. That's where I'll be focusing most of my time, Ezekiel chapter 9. But I'm going to read from Timothy and Romans and Peter. Second Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Elohim, having a form of godliness or righteousness, but denying its power from such, turn away. Romans 1, starting at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of Elohim, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, and com- impassable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of Elohim, that they who commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I want to express the fear of Yahweh. (laughs) The fear of Yahweh. I tried to come up with something else. I really did. I wrestled with Yahweh. But Yahweh won. The fear of Yahweh is essential. You know, a lot of times we look, especially when we're reading Timothy, know this in the last days, perilous times will come. And we look at out there in the wonderful world at the perilous times. And we say, yes, look at them them homosexuals and all them fornicators and look at the government and look and look and look and look. But Yahweh is saying, "Mm mm-mm, you look in the wrong place. Yahweh said, I don't care what's going on out there in the world. I'm talking about my people. I'm talking about in them last days. Let me tell you what my people is going to be like. My people are going to be lovers of their own selves. My people are going to be proud, and they're going to be boasters and blasphemers. My people are going to be lovers of pleasure more than they love me. My people. And when I look, I see. I see that the churches teach you to be covetous. They teach you to be covetous. They teach you that you should want wealth and have all this stuff in the world. Scriptures say, may you prosper as your soul prospers. Their souls are not prospering. And nobody's telling them how to prosper their souls. They have a form, looks like righteousness. But they deny the power. And let's look at them talking, telling us how the gifts were for the first century. We don't need them anymore. You don't need them? We need them more now than they did then. They talk about that because they don't understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So they 
if they teach it, they got it like, oh, just say you believe and you got it. Where's the power? Power. And you will be endued with power. Power. They look like the people of Yahweh. They look like the people of Yahweh. But they deny his power. In Romans 1, that's a scary chapter. That's a scary chapter. I wanted to put the fear of Yahweh in you. These are people that knew Yahweh at some point in their life. Now, how serious they were, that's up for debate. But they knew Yahweh. And the scripture says very simply, there was one thing that they ceased to do, and that was give Yahweh his glory. And they became filled with all unrighteousness. But the last verse, really, who knowing the judgment of Elohim, they know there's a judgment day. They are well aware, but they don't care. They commit such things that are worthy of death. But they don't just stop there. They take pleasure in those that do likewise. These are the people having a form of righteousness, looking like Yahweh's people. Now, there are some scriptures, I mentioned one at the table today, that truly scares me. Did not I do in your name? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That should put some fear in you. Should put some fear in you. These are people professing to do works in his name. And he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They had a form. They looked like. But he's called them workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew knew you. Not that I once knew you. I knew you when you was young. I knew you when you first got saved. I never knew you. Never knew you. Why should this concern us if we are lining ourselves upright? Verse Peter 4. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of Elohim. And if it first begins with us, what will the end of them that obey not the gospel of Elohim? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous be scarcely saved, What? What? The word tells me he's able to save to the utmost. But now the righteous are scarcely being saved? Why? Because we're not following directions. We linger in by the gate, looking at the other side and how I miss it. And if I do a little, it'll be all right. And we've got all these theologians and all these scholarly people rationalizing this stuff away that Yahweh says is unholy. I don't care what you say. I said it's unholy. You want to make it? He said, be ye holy as I am holy. That's the only way you're making it. Praise his holy name. He didn't just say that and say, now, figure it out. He said, oh, they got that flesh. They need some help. Let me help them. First, I'll give them a bath with some stuff that the world thinks is not what you use to take a bath in. I'm going to give them some blood, and it's going to cleanse them 
from all unrighteousness. And then I'm going to teach them how to stay clean. My mother tells me a story when I was little. I've always been a tomboy. She said it would rain and those puddles would be outside and I would have you in these nice little dresses and you would go get in those puddles. Now she's telling me this and I'm in high school and I would say if you knew that why'd you put those nice little dresses on me? We just have a tendency to go back to what's comfortable. Our flesh is comfortable. It's pleasurable. If it wasn't so, we wouldn't yearn to those things. Can't say that sin isn't fun. Can't tell these children sin isn't fun. It is. That's why you want to do it. But let me tell you, it's deadly. It will kill you. It's deadly. Yeah, it feels good, but it is deadly. It will kill you. If not in the judgment, some sin takes you right on off. You know, we're looking at, when we look here in Timothy and in Romans, we're looking at the course of sin. You know, uh, with the 9-11 incident and, you know, all the AIDS and everybody. Is, do you think it's Yahweh's judgment? I'm like, no, it's the course of sin. Sin just goes that way. When you sin, it ends up in death. When you're proud, somebody's going to try to smack you down. It, you just can't. It, it's the natural course of sin. And this is the natural course of sin. Sin has crept into Yahweh's people, and it's the natural course that it's running. And the natural course is I get a big head. I don't think I have to listen to anybody. I'm not grateful, and I rationalize my unholiness. You know, Yahweh knows I have needs. I rationalize it all away, and it makes perfect sense to me and obviously to trillions of people because we're all doing it, and so therefore I look good. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And the devil got them out there thinking, because it's coming from the church, that all you, once saved, always saved. We started looking at the feast today. And when we get into the, it is so, again, just looking at the feast. Don't do it. You're kicked out. Out you go. Where did you ever come up with once saved, always saved? If Yahweh is the same, he said, you don't do it, see ya. See ya. It's not like I'm going to make you. Just see ya. You don't have to be a part. That's fine. Your choice. But you won't be here. You won't be here. You do it my way or build your own kingdom. You can't be a part of mine. Yahweh is loving, yes, but he's not a democracy. You don't get to vote. And majority rules. I don't know where they come up with this. Where do they get this from? King of kings. What he says is law. And even the kings of the earth knew that. It comes out of my mouth, it's the law. And they were just men, but they understood the concept. I am the king. But why is it that we say, oh, yes, I'm under the king of kings, but we vote. Yes, I know he doesn't really like that, but he understands. Oh, where's the order in that? It's so contradictory. It's so contradictory to the rest of the word. But judgment begins in the house of Elohim. When you look through the scripture, I want you to know something. Yahweh never fools with the wicked people. He'll use them to punish the righteous people that have gone wicked. But they all have a day. And he don't care. 
when the day comes, they'll be judged. But you, I will judge. My house, my roles. Guess what? I don't like it. You know, and people want, oh, well, he said, come, let us reason together. Oh, no, please don't misunderstand that. He's not saying we can have a discussion and we'll compromise. He's saying, sit down and let me tell you how it is. That's, that's, that's you reasoning. You coming to a right mind. Sit down and listen to what Yahweh has to say. That's the rationale. It's not like we'll discuss the matter and maybe I can convince Yahweh to change his mind. There's not... Change his mind about what? Is he holy? Is he righteous? You want him to become unholy? You want him to become unrighteous? That's very hazardous to your well-being. We don't want Yahweh to change. Ezekiel 9. This is a scary chapter. You know, the scripture tells me that I should seek Yahweh while he may be found. The implication there is there may come a day when he won't be found. Have you sought Yahweh today? Because tomorrow might be the day he won't be found. This is a scary thought. I take for granted that Yahweh will be there. I mean, you listen, I, may, I know you all know people. They're getting it right tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll do it right tomorrow. What faith? What faith? But tomorrow might be the day he won't be found. And then what do you do? All your crying. All oh, your Yahweh, please, 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 please. Chapter 9, of course, comes after chapter 8. And I didn't want to take a lot of time, but chapter 8, I will do a quick summary. Ezekiel is, of course, a prophet of Yahweh, and Yahweh shows him things. So in chapter 8, Yahweh yanks Ezekiel up by his hair on his head. And lifts him way up in the city so he can see. And he shows him Jerusalem. Okay, that's the peop where the people of Yahweh live. Okay. And he shows him from like the outside. It's a walled city, so he shows him from the outside and he works his way in to the sanctuary, to the tabernacle, to between the porch and the brazen altar which is where the labor would usually be. So he starts outside the city, works his way in, and Yahweh just keeps pointing, look at that. Abomination. Look at that. Abomination. Look at that. And he takes him from the common people to the elders, to the priests. And it's really sad because when he shows him between the porch and the brazen altar, Scripture numbers him 25, and their faces are turned away from the sanctuary, and they're worshiping the sun. In Yahweh's, in Yahweh's tabernacle, in his house, in his house, they're worshiping some other God in his very own house. It's offensive. It's not only an abomination, it's an offense. Coming up in my house, in my house, and doing something that you know, that you know I don't like. Who do you think I am? And if you read the eighth chapter, he said, that's why I'm not there no more. I left. They drove me out. They drove me out. 
because of this stuff. I'm not there no more. Where I used to be at the, in the, between the cherubims, I am gone. I am not there no more because they drove me out. His own house. Imagine. You imagine you people got your own home. Somebody coming up in there tuck, doing something and making you leave your own house. This is Yahweh's house, and they drove him away. So he said, all right. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Elohim of Israel had gone up from the cherub, on which he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And Yahweh said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abomination that are done in the midst of it. And to the others, he said, in my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old, young, maids, little children, women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the elderly men who were before the house, and he said to them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Yahweh Elohim, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel and thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then he said, then said he to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great and the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness for they say, Yahweh hath forsaken the earth, and Yahweh seeth not. And as for me also, my eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, who had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Scary chapter. And Yahweh said, My eye shall not spare, and I will not have pity. Let me tell you something. Yahweh is a loving, no, Yahweh is love. But do not think that because he is love that you can just keep on Staying in your filth and in your wickedness. If you want to keep in your filth and in your wickedness, you can do it. But don't come in Yahweh's house with it. Don't come into the presence of Yahweh with it. Because let me tell you, yeah, he'll have compassion. This don't happen in a day. When this happened, hundreds of years Israel been doing this stuff. Hundreds of years They've been doing this stuff. They've been professing the worship of Yahweh, but using the techniques and methods of worshiping idols that Yahweh told them not to do. 
We have let stuff, we've compromised and let stuff creep in. That's what they did. They let stuff creep in. I remember, I can't remember which king or which priest, y'all can help me out. The one king goes to Damascus. He sees this fabulous altar. It's nice. And he thinks, yes, Yahweh deserves an altar like this. So he goes back to the priest and he tells the priest, I want an altar made like this. So the priest does it. Stupid. And then the king wants him to replace the brazen altar with this altar that he made. And I can understand the priest in fear for his life. But Yahweh put that brazen altar there. Yahweh, if he wanted something spectacular and fabulous with all them jewels, and he could have told you to make it, but he didn't want that. He didn't want that. And this priest did it. I read that story, and I'm like, is he, like, insane? Where is the fear of Yahweh? Where is the fear of Yahweh? Why do you think that Yahweh's just, I wouldn't want a God like that. If he was a yes man? I wouldn't want a God like, I don't want a God like that because he's not much of a God if he's a yes man. I want somebody who knows some stuff. Mine does. And mine's holy and I don't care. He will not be defiled. He made a way for me to be holy like he is holy. That's a gracious Elohim. Knew I couldn't do it. Gave me help. Sent his own spirit, his own self, to come and live in me, to help me. That's a gracious, loving God. Who? made a way that even when I fall, I don't fear that he kicks me out because he made a way that the blood never loses its power. I do the procedure, repent, confess. Quickly he forgives. Wow, that is a gracious, loving Elohim. That's awesome. That is awesome. And he doesn't have a checklist. You know, clean. He's not covered. Clean. Clean. Why would I want to make him anything less than what he is? And when you think that you can play around with Yahweh, that you think, think that you can yield to the desires of your flesh when you think you can have a big head see the problem with Yahweh's people is not necessarily all this physicalness because we know how to keep the body in check I am not doing those sins I think I'm good to go what's your thought life like What's your life like with your brothers and your sisters? I think Yahshua was very plain. He said, I'm not a murderer. Hate your brother without a cause. Even if you got a cause, hate your brother. How can you love me and hate your brother? I think Yahshua said that. I, it's, it's quoted in the scripture. Hate your brother, can't love me. What's your life like? I love that song. You knew I had to bring a song in, right? (laughs) I love that song. God don't play second fiddle. Now, if you understand orchestra, you know, you got the lead violin, you got second violin, and as the song sets up, you know, there's the angels in heaven, and they're all getting together, and they're going to play a song, and Gabriel is the lead violinist. 
And so they're deciding on what song they're going to play, and then when they get ready to do get, get started, in comes Yowie. Air is silent. But y'all didn't know Yowie plays violin, huh? So Gabriel sees him, puts down his bow, and slides down to second chair because y'all don't play second fiddle. He don't play second fiddle. And if he's going to play, it's going to be the lead. If he's going to play, it's going to be the lead. But it's about the first commandment. The chorus is, it became a law when he wrote it in stone. And when he came to earth, he said it again. Don't be fooled into thinking that it's not a crime. And then I listened to the song and I said, hmm, it's a great song. But I wonder, because he never mentions the commandment, never says in that song, just says it's number one in the list of ten. Guess what? If you don't know what the ten are, you don't know what number one is. The song, I like it. I know what number one is. But I think about all the people that might listen to that song, and do they know what he's talking about? Because he never says the commandment. He never says about keeping. You can get kind of figured out from the two little verses. But he never says it. But it's number one in the list of his big ten. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And if you look at chapter 8 of Ezekiel, that's their problem. They got the idols set up. They're right in the house of Yahweh, worshiping the sun. Now, we are not in an age where we bow down to idols. Things made of stone and of wood because we're like Yahweh in the sense that when we read Isaiah it really is funny I mean that is funny their thought process back in the day and Yahweh's saying through Isaiah you know they take a piece of wood they use some for cooking making a fire they cut some of it up for furniture and then what's left they carve an idol and they worship it is, that is funny. That is funny. We are better than that. We don't do that because we see that is so stupid. Why? How do you make a god out of something that you just mastered? That's stupid. Oh, we've gotten more crafty with our gods, our idols. And then we have the audacity to call them Yahweh. I don't know which is the bigger sin. Having some idol that I fashioned, formed, and made, and calling it Yahweh. Israel never once ceased from the worship of Yahweh. They didn't. Swear up and down. I worship the one true God, and his name is Yahweh. That's why Yahweh said, I hate your Sabbath your new moons, and your feasts. I could see the people. What is he talking about? These are the days he gave us. What is he talking about? They didn't understand. Yeah, they were my days, but that ain't how I said to do it. You done took it and made it your own. So I hate your days. Yahweh is saying the same thing to us. He, I mean, I'm, I want to put the fear of Yahweh in you. There is a day, and I'm not talking about the judgment day. I'm talking about when Yahweh cleans his house, it's not going to be on that day because his people are going to be ready and shining before that happens. This is today. Peter said, for the time has come. It's now. Yahweh is going to judge his people. See, forget the world. They got a judgment day set aside in the future. Yours is today. Yours is today. So, and if it starts here, man, I feel sorry for them out there. 
and I'm going to cry for them out there and, and I try to help them out there. But before I do that, I better listen to the words of the song that we sang. You know, I want to take your word and shine it all around, but first let me learn how to live it. You know, I want to do, but self-examine. Self-examine. Not at Passover time. I mean, the, you know, it's a memorial. It is a memorial to remind us that we need to do this. But this is something we should be doing every day. Every day. Not once a day. You know, get up, start right. Pray. Thank you, Yahweh, for this day. Bless me. May I do your will. Keep my mind straight, especially when we work and deal with our people we have to deal with. And then in the middle of the day, I might have lost it because I didn't like my job or it's overwhelmed, whatever the reason. The kids are driving me crazy. Check it. Check it in the middle of the day. And then at the end of the day, you know what, Yahweh? I was really busy today. Did I miss something? Did I sin somewhere along the way? Did I, did I miss an opportunity? Did I speak inappropriately to somebody? Did I neglect something? Did I show me, Yahweh? Forgive me, Yahweh. Let me catch all my opportunities, Yahweh. You know, we want to make sure that we're right before Yahweh because there's coming a day that he isn't going to have pity on me. That I, I didn't look up all the scriptures, but the one scripture said he's going to laugh at your calamity. <laughs> You're in trouble again? <laughs> oh, I ain't helping you. That's scary. That's not funny. That is scary. I, I need him to be on my side. I don't know about you all, but I'd like to get there and see his face. I've made some sacrifices. Not that I want to brag because they sure as heck haven't been enough because I need his pity. I need his pity. I need him to look down on me and say, oh, that poor child, let me help her again. And when I get in my mess, I, don't, I sure don't need him laughing at me. I need help. And he will do it if you stay in relationship. If I find him before the day he can't be found, I'll always have him. I'll always have, if I find him before the day he can't be found, I'll always have him. So don't wait until tomorrow because he might not be found. Don't get into another mess because that might be the last one where he's going to laugh at you. Do not play with Yahweh. He is merciful. He is gracious. Hallelujah. We thank him every day. But do not step out. Things happen. There are the devil's a, he's an enemy. He's setting traps. Do not confuse this. With this willful, this is willful. Notice what it said in Romans. Who knowing, know the judgment of Yahweh. They know it, but they don't care. We're talking about willful sin. Hebrews say, willful sin, guess what? Ain't no more sacrifice for you. No more sacrifice for you. Now what you going to do? Do not think that I can repent afterwards. Do not disrespect. That is such a disrespect to the Elohim that you say is all that. That is disrespect. That is saying he doesn't mean what he says. That is saying he's a yes man. Judge ourselves every day. Yeshua gave us very clear instruction. Judge not, lest ye be judged. But he also talked about judging yourself. Judge yourself, therefore you don't have to fall into judgment. Self-examine every day. Three times a day. Twelve times a day. May depend on how your day is. You know, some days might need a little bit more than other days. But desire to be right before Yahweh. And the only way you'll do that is if you have a fear of Yahweh. 
If you don't fear Yahweh, you won't think that he's going to come get you. You won't think there's a punishment. Isn't it a wonderful thing that the devil has people believing, oh, yes, there's a God, but I don't exist. You know, lots of people believe there's a God, but don't believe there's a devil. Lots of people sit in the pew and go home and live their life any way they want. The church is not teaching holiness anymore. Or they're teaching their own brand of holiness. Yahweh said he's holy, expects you to be like him, made it possible. And I'm just living in fear, in the, not in the sense of, uh, you know, he's a tyrant, but living in fear that I will mess up one day and there won't be nothing for me. And I don't want that to happen. And again, make the, I'm not talking about the devil getting you in a trap. I'm talking about you, your thought process, you thinking you can do it, and it'll be all right. Because it's not. It's not. Yahweh said it's an abomination, and he said, and they drove me out. I won't go there, but they le- he left. He left. Think about it. 